Today's event is a joint effort of the South Dakota No-Till Association, the Mitchell NRCS off Field Office, SDSU Extension, and the NRCS. And one of the first things I'd like to do is uh, thank all our sponsors that helped us put together and provided input and money uh, for today's event. And I'm going to just read through the list. Um, South Dakota Wheat Commission, Farm Credit Services of America, Wheat Growers, Mustang Seed, Monsanto, Prairie State Seeds, Next Level Ag LLC, Millborn Seeds, La Crosse Seeds, Dakota Best Seed, Agronomy Plus, Farmers Alliance, Mitchell, First Dakota National Bank, C&B Operations in Davidson County Implement, Scott Supply, Crop Tech, Ducks Unlimited, Aurora County Conservation District, Davidson County Conservation District, Hanson County Conservation District, uh, South Dakota No-Till Association, SDSU Extension, USDA and NRCS, and Pioneer Hybrids of DuPont. So let's give them all a welcome round of applause. Huh. So Ruth said you've got just a little bit of time to talk about a lot, a lot of things. So we're going to hit a few things real lightly uh, today. Dakota Lakes Research Farm, as you probably know, uh, should know by now, uh, is located east of Pier along the Missouri River. Uh, we have both irrigated and dry land stuff. I went back through all the talks that I've done over the years here and, and kind of looked at those and, and I summarized those real neatly. Uh, if you're in this part of the world, you want to take the E out of ET. ET is evapotranspiration. You want all the water to go through plants. And, and as every one of the speakers so far today has talked about, the idea is to get plants growing, roots in the ground, those kind of things. We want to maximize snow catch. That's one of the things uh, <clears throat> we want to do. We want to get some vertical ar architecture up there. Uh, you got to decide which information sources you can trust. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of people try to tell you a lot of things, especially when it comes to cover crops and stuff. Some of them don't really know what they're talking about. So uh, decide which one of those that you can trust and then start listening to them. Address the problem instead of treating the symptom. You know, we, <clears throat> we talked about water hemp. John did just uh, shortly ago. Well, the reason they got a water hemp in the eastern part of the United States is they don't have enough diversity and they don't have enough cover and, and whatever. So they have water hemp. They have resistant weeds. Let's go back and fix it. Uh, I always like to pick on NRCS because they had you guys building a lot of terraces. <clears throat> terraces don't make the water go in the ground. So that water infiltration kit that they're handing out here, that would have told you water doesn't go in the ground. Just putting a ditch up there to keep from running out of the field doesn't really make the crop grow better. The idea is to make the water go in the ground. And no-till does that. Cover crops can help us do that to a certain uh, <clears throat> extent. Mother Nature's an opportunist. If you have a problem, you've created the opportunity. So if you've got a weed or a disease or an insect or anything happening, Someplace in the way you designed your system, you've created that opportunity because Mother Nature will come in and, and fill that. And uh, I see Daryl's here, so Daryl Denneke's sitting back there. But years and years ago, we were, when they first came out with, at that kind of time, they called it Emmy corn, pursuit tolerant corn. And I had a young producer in Sioux Falls tell me, you don't have to worry about crop rotation because I got pursuit corn and pursuit beans and I can just use pursuit and I won't have any resi any any problems and I said well you're going to have resistant weeds and cyanamide at the time took umbrage with me saying that because there was no proof that there was going to be resistant weeds I think also said they'd be cross resistance to other ALS herbicides and they wanted a retraction and all we did is Leon and Daryl come out and put in a trial for me and I went up to my neighbors and found some I don't know if you knew I went and done that found some <laughs> found some <coughs> glean tolerant kosher weeds and shook it around over top of that trial. And voila, we had our proof. Uh, strive to produce a crop which is healthy, not a crop that does not get sick. So remember that too. We, we spend a lot of time trying to treat things 
that are getting sick when we should really just be trying to make sure we, we keep it healthy. So that really takes a whole system, and you guys have all seen that. If you can know only one thing about a soil, what parameter would you want to know? And, and Jay Fuhrer hit this a bit today. I'm going to hit it harder. Within all textural groups, as organic matter increased from 1 to 3 percent, available water holding capacity doubled. When organic matter content increased to 4 percent, it then accounted for more than 60 percent of available water holding capacity. In the Red River Valley, they have salinity and waterlogging problems because their water doesn't hold as much, soil doesn't hold as much water as it should. We have the same problem here. Our soils no longer hold as much water. They used to hold this much water. Now they hold this much water. So when we get a little bit of rain, they're waterlogged and we get saline seeps and we get waterlogging, whatever, if we had deeper soils in terms of water holding capacity, then we could hold more water. We wouldn't get <coughs> wet, waterlogged early. We wouldn't get dry late and we wouldn't have as much problem with salinity. When organic matter contents increased 4% and then accounted for more than 60% of the available water holding capacity. When soil water storage capacity is low, much of the rain that falls during extended periods of precipitation is lost. In contrast, high water storage capacity combined with effective capture of rain by making the water go in the ground and snow melt over the fall, winter, and spring can support a crop through extended dry periods. And what we're trying to do with cover crops, and they don't have as big a fit here as they do in Illinois where they have, in Indiana, where they have longer growing seasons and more rain, but uh, we have opportunities here. What we're trying to do is take these cool periods of, these, of the year, or these odd periods of the year, and build organic matter and suppress weeds and do some of those things. And, and we only do that when we have the opportunity. Short-term studies are not accurate in evaluating treatments. I was impressed that John was showing us 20-some years of treatments. That's very, very rare anymore. And we do that at Dakota Lakes, but not very many people do that. A farmer manages ecosystems. You take sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide and make them into products to be sold. That's your business. You're capturing sunlight. And if you're only growing corn and soybeans, you're capturing just a very small percentage of the sunlight every year. Let's capture more sunlight, because the energy from the sunlight that goes into the soil or whatever, that's the stuff that drives that whole ecosystem. Uh, crop rotations allow for time for natural enemies to destroy the pathogens of one crop while unrelated crops are growing, and we spend our whole career working on crop rotation. Proper intensity, adequate diversity, and then we're stable. And, and proper intensity is, is matching that natural water cycle. Native vegetation is the best way to tell what you can do. As I travel around the world, the first thing I do is look at the native vegetation. And Jay can tell you that. That's one of the things he does too, right? You look at the native vegetation. That integrates the soil characteristics the climate, including the rainfall and temperatures and those kind of things, that integrates them all into one package. People always say, how much rainfall you get? It's, it, it, it's relative. Amarillo, Texas, Pierce, South Dakota, and Brandon, Manitoba get exactly the same rainfall. Amarillo, Texas is a desert. Pierce, South Dakota is a prairie. Brandon, Manitoba is what they call a parkland, which is trees and tall grass prairie. Same amount of rainfall, different temperatures, different amounts of heat. Organic matter is important. When we take off stuff, somebody started talking about hay today and I was about ready to go crazy in the back of the room. If you take off a 75 bushel acre wheat crop or half of a 150 bushel acre corn crop, you take off 100 pounds a N, I mean 50 pounds a N, five pounds of P, 100 pounds of K and 3,000 pounds of carbon. You're mining. One unit train of soybeans. These nice circle tracks, 110 cars. One unit train of soybeans has uh, 400,000 pounds of phosphorus. 
If we keep shipping that stuff out, we're mining. Because the Chinese aren't sending it back. Okay, so in what happens if we do that for 100 years? We won't have any soils left. And Jay already told you, and they don't have any soils left in the Red River Valley. So they're putting in drain tile to get rid of that excess water so we can get in Lake, Lake Winnipeg and screw up Lake Winnipeg, right? <laughs> Matching water use to the climate and soils is imperative. Okay? Matching water use to what you have. <clears throat> Most of the plant growth problems blamed on no-till are a result of inadequate diversity and proper intensity or errors in technique. No reason for errors in technique anymore. We've got good equipment, so let's get our diversity and intensity right. In human environments, tall grass prairie are wetter. The goal should be to have something growing at all times. That's this area in the east. Should have something growing at all times. Uh, that's going to require the use of cover crops or forage double crops because you can't really do two grain crops in a year. There's not enough time. Okay? Subhumid, semi-arid, pure South Dakota arid environments, cover crops can be utilized to increase organic matter and biological activity. We're going to use them less frequently because we don't have the moisture. Cover crops are like tillage. In wet environments, more and longer cover and forage periods are needed. In uh, drier environments, residue loss can be an issue if the wrong species are cho chosen. Lots of emphasis on some people using radishes, turnips, and, and, and rapeseed and those kind of things. Those are brassicas, they get rid of residue. You're gonna to be too bare too fast. As you get drier, you gotta really limit how many of those you put in there, okay? Number one, <clears throat> decide what you wanna do before trying to choose a cover crop. John said this, you know, he said it several times. Guy right for me. I wanna, I wanna tell you that John Pike Seed Company <clears throat> that family seed company went away. The Beck Seed Company he mentioned is still there. <laughs> no damn relatives of mine. Mine all got hung for horse thieving, but I thought I should throw that in there. <laughs> Think of your cover crop as just another component of your rotation. It's not separate. You got to know what you're going to do, right? Using a mixture of cover crops allows meeting several goals simultaneously. Mixtures add more diversity, grow at different times, better compete with weeds, optimize nutrient cycling, etc. But be careful not to bridge diseases or insects. Choose your mix carefully. Got a call from a major cover crop seed supplier. He said one of my growers said that his soybeans behind cover crop did not yield as good as his soybeans where he didn't have cover crop because he had Phytophthora. I said, <clears throat> what did you have in the cover crop mix? Oh, so we had just our normal 12-way mix. I said, well, give me the list. Soybeans were in that list. Ah, don't do that. But now in the old days, in the Jim River Valley, here in North, when <clears throat> When guys were going to grow soybeans for the first time, 25, 30 years ago, 25 years ago or more, I'd say, okay, go after wheat and plant some soybeans as a cover crop after the wheat before you put the soybeans in the next spring because you need to prime that rhizobia pump. Get some rhizobia inoculum out there, otherwise you'll never be as good. That's the first time. Don't do that ever again. Okay, so think about what you're trying to do. Creating conditions beneficial for the next crop is one of the goals. Water and nutrient management, another primary goal. Water used by a cover crop during the non-crop period can often be regained during the growing season because of better infiltration, reduced runoff, improved water relations, more cover. More cover if you do it right. Remember I talked about the brassicas. Here's the thing that Jason Miller and I did. Uh, I had a, this was back in 2008, I had a winter wheat corn field pea rotation. There's a wheat stubble, no cover crop. This was on the 9th of July. We still had this total cover to stop the E from the soil. 
Back up, back up. Here's right next to it, we had a rotation that had actually more cover, spring wheat, winter wheat corn, but we put a brassica cover crop in there. It's almost bare. I think it was about 20 bushel difference because we lost the residue, okay? Understand your rainfall patterns for your area and the water holding capacity of your soils in order to plan how you're going to do this and use web soil survey. Here's one of my soils. We farm some West River stuff. We got Jim Finley, used to be one of my board guys, he can tell you about that. We, if I take a web soil survey, there is my north unit, okay? This is five miles north of the farm. This is a promise soil, an opal soil. The glacier went around here. This is the old ocean bottom. This is a West River Pier Shale Drive soil. That field right here is Jimmy Corco's bucking horse pasture. <clears throat> you really never have lived until you have a rodeo contractor as a neighbor, okay? <laughs> Comes the Cadillac, window goes down, goes, see any horses? <laughs> yep. How many? About 120. How long ago? Oh, about an hour and a half. Mm. Where'd they go? That way. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so what this means is this, you can get all kinds of stuff off a of web soil survey, and if you don't know how to use that, you need to get it and get an app on your phone. I can tell you what soil used to be here before they built the building. Talk to your NRCS people. What this says is this somewhere between five no, three and six and a half inches of total available water on this spot. That heavy soil does not hold very much available water. I manage that soil, it's very heavy clay, I manage that much different than I do my main farm. Here's a little gate glacial tongue that comes out there. Okay, that one holds about seven inches, okay? These opals up in here hold less than three because they're only about this deep to shale. Here's the main farm. Here's my good Lowry's, right? Those are more like you guys have. You can see I got some of the red ones and those and the whatever. But these will hold about 10 inches of water. I manage that differently than something that holds five. So once I know how much my bucket holds, then I go get my rainfall. This is Mitchell. And I've got, a, I've, got a, I've, I've got an Excel spreadsheet that'll do this for you. You've got every rainfall from every station in the state of South Dakota, and you can do this type of thing for you. So I start from October to October, annual precept, Mitchell 22.06 or 86. This is from a few years ago. So now everybody's going, well, we get more rainfall now. Okay, well, that's fine. So we're going to look at what happens when you didn't get as much rainfall. Take the E out of ET, from July to June, from when you would harvest wheat until you would need water for your corn, corn doesn't use any water before June, you get 19.34 inches of rain. How much does the soil hold? <laughs> 7, 10, maybe 12. If it was totally dry when you harvested the wheat, which it normally isn't totally dry to four feet when you harvested the wheat, <clears throat> you hold 10 or 12, you got trying to put 19 inches of water in there. And guys say, I don't want to know till it's too damn wet in the spring. What a wonderful problem to have if you live in South Dakota. Right? Come on. So let's turn that into an opportunity. And that's where you have a chance to do something. If you go wheat to sunflowers, it's 22 inches. But that's the type of, where if you plant peas and grow wheat, that you have that 22 inches. If, I'm backing up one, if you get half a normal, which we seldom do, it's still nine inches, almost 10 inches. 
If you get half a normal and you keep taking the EIDET and haven't done tillage and you make the water go in the ground and do all those things you're supposed to do, you're going to fill the soil up at half of normal. So you're always going to be too wet, okay? <clears throat> That's why you grow good wheat after peas. Okay, <clears throat> from October to June, 1st of October, 1st of June, from corn to sunflowers, 12.1, you're still going to fill the soil up. If you've got good cover, take the E out of ET, that kind of stuff, right? So, <clears throat> half a normal 6.06. .06. When we first told guys at Gettysburg and Pier they should put their sunflowers into corn, they thought I was stark raving mad. Now, if you drive from Blunt to Gettysburg, they're all got their sunflowers in the corn. Because you've got to do the numbers. July to November. This is your opportunity. Fall cover crop. July to November, 8.34 inches. That other one was 19. If you use that 8, you're still going to have enough to fill that soil by the time corn needs it. If you're doing all the things we talk about. And you keep the cover. And you do that kind of stuff, right? Even in half a normal, you got four, that's enough. You can use that and you'll see you're going to have enough uh, to get your corn started the next year. July to September, when you harvest your wheat to when you uh, peas to when you do winter wheat, uh, there's not enough time there, not enough water to try to do a cover crop on dry land. We will do this with irrigation. The old long fallow, you guys all look at me. I grew up 60 miles from here. <clears throat> we did long fallow on a half section of ground because the landlord wanted that. Wheat, milo, long fallow. We had saline seeps, god awful mess in there. And I had no idea. When I got older and got a little more educated, I go, Jesus, what a stupid damn thing to do. Right? <clears throat> now they farm it the way they should and they don't have the saline seep problem. Cover crop seeds need to be inexpensive in terms of cost per acre. Small seeds mean less volume. You know, we, we look in our shed, but be careful to not do peas as cover crops. If you're doing peas someplace in the rotation, you'd like to have about a six year break between pea crops to not get root diseases or lentils. Some of these crops you gotta be careful with. Small seeds grow better on the surface than larger seeds. Large seeds emerge better through a mat of residue. Mixing large and small seeds in the same trench helps us, the large seeds help the small seeds emerge better. They kind of break the path. Using harrows to improve the stand of surface broadcast seed improves the stand of weeds as well. <laughs> and, and it makes your residue go away, right? It's not, not one of the things you like to do. One important goal is to use a uh, the cover crop to balance the diet of the soil organisms. Ron Alverson was asking some questions before about how do I, you know, shouldn't I add more carbon or whatever, and I'm sitting back there with him saying, well, Ron, maybe let's put some cover crops in and up, up your nitrogen and carbon, but have a higher proportion and if you want to get more in in the system to balance your high carbon. So that's kind of what you do with that thing. It's kind of like feeding cows. Is you, want, you don't feed a cow straight straw. She needs to have some protein. And the trouble with feeding a cow straight straw is she just can't eat enough of it. Because you can't digest it. Right? <clears throat> it's not good food for her. So you've got to give her a little protein and then that makes it good food. So that's <clears throat> thing. Managing cover crops is more of an art than a science at this point. If anybody tells you they know how to do it, they're a liar. I mean, it's just really more of an art. If at least some component of a rotation do not feel an excessively dry year, John was talking about 2012. If you didn't fail in 2012 with some of your components, we harvested really good winter wheat in 2012. But the corn sucked. Okay? But if some of those components don't fail, 
<clears throat> then you don't have enough intensity. Nobody, everybody wants to have a rotation that doesn't fail when it's dry. But if you don't fail when it's really dry like that, you haven't taken full advantage of a normal year and you will fail badly in wet years. And this is what's happened to a lot of people. They've been overly cautious. And then they fail because it's too wet. If you look at a guy that still does wheat summer fallow, I was in Montana a couple weeks ago, they still do wheat summer fallow there. Right? <laughs> pH is a five because they're leaching all the lime out. The lime's at three foot and then they're telling them to put lime on the top because they put all their lime down below. I mean like get some roots out there, bring the stuff from below back to the surface where it belongs. But I just said to them guys, nine years out of ten you fail because you followed that ground and you could have done something with it. You failed. Nine years out of ten when you did summer fell. So take about water cycle, energy flow, mineral cycle, community dynamics. Okay, mineral cycle, are the nutrients available for plant use or have they been leached, eroded, or transported from the landscape? Ecosystems that leak nutrients become deserts. One of those nutrients is carbon. Jay talked about losing carbon, gaining carbon, losing carbon, gaining carbon. If we keep losing carbon, we're going to turn into a desert. This is easy. Good. Good students. Saline seeps indicate leakage. Decreasing pH indicates leakings. One unit train. Soybeans, almost a half a million pounds. So saline seep, rain here goes here. We've got to get this cycle fixed here. It's really a water cycling issue. I call this catch and release nutrients. What's in a saline seep? Salt. I used to teach chemistry. There's lots of salts, right? Every take an acid to base to make a salt. So salt isn't an answer. Number one thing that's in a saline seep is nitrate. That's fertilizer. Number two thing that's in there is calcium sulfate. That's gypsum. That's a fertilizer. Number three thing that's in there is calcium carbonate. That's lime, that's a fertilizer. So when I ask you that question, you're supposed to say fertilizer. Okay, so all the kids from SCSU and all the kids from Watertown that come and visit, I got the instructors trained, and I ask those kids that question, they all go, fertilizer. Because <laughs> if they don't say that, then I yell at the instructor. <clears throat> if you get stranded in the rain in the back 40, you drive home across the tilled field or the pasture. <laughs> Pasture. People say, oh, I get, you know, by no-till, it's too wet, and I get stuck. It's not no-till's fault. You haven't got the soil structure there yet, and you haven't got your water cycle fixed. Organic matter makes a difference. We've been running some rotations at Red at Pier for, since 1990. Here's some winter wheat in 2006. It doesn't look very good. Right across the road, it looks like this. What's the difference? Well, if I look at those two fields, this is a good one, this is a bad one. Both of them were winter wheat that followed peas, that followed corn. This rotation's identical, except I've got an extra soybean in there. Soybeans are low in carbon, peas are low in carbon, wheat and corn are high in carbon. So in one of those I got two thirds high carbon, one third low, and the other one's half and half. Corn, soybeans, half and half, you don't have enough carbon unless you add some carbon some other place. So what's that mean for yield? With 7.9 inches of rain, or total, total precept between when the peas harvested and the wheat was harvested, 7.9 inches in 2006, 60 versus 29, 23.7 in 2005, 92 versus 57, 6.4 in two, uh, 2002, 56 versus 28. <clears throat> organic matter makes a difference but you kind of had to be there for a few years and we John showed that too right? it takes a little while to restore those soils because they've been degraded it wasn't our fault but we're fixing them if you if you get a chance watch the Cronin Farms video Leopold video 
Mike says, well, Grandpa broke the land, and my dad mined the land, and, and it's up to Monty and I to fix it. <laughs> right? Okay, that's, it's up to us to fix it. This year, okay, here's that two-thirds high residue, 95 bushel, 13.4. Here's that half, 80. Here's another half with carinata instead of peas, 60. <laughs> Here's where I've got even higher carbon count, content, 95 and 87. Organic matter makes a difference. <clears throat> Alternate year wheat. This is old data from 1990s. Every other year wheat, half high residue, half low residue, 46 bushel. Two years high and one year low, 53. Here I got two years of wheat and one year of corn, 48.4, but that's Organic matter makes a difference. Here's what it cost me in 1990s to grow this. Here's a fallow thing, wheat corn fallow, wheat corn pea. It cost me 460 to do wheat fallow, 379 to do wheat corn fallow, 245 to do wheat corn pea. People used to ask me, do you make any money on them dang peas? I said, I don't need to make money on peas, I just have to lose less money than it cost me to summer fallow. <laughs> right? I, I used to love doing that to people. We ran that study out in Lyman County for 12 years. And, and in the 13th year, I put the whole thing into spring wheat. And I've shown a lot of, over the years, shown a lot of weed things from there. I've never shown you this yield. 2002, really dry year, right? Uh, where, we, where we did wheat canola. This all went to spring wheat. So where we had done wheat canola for 12 years and then planted spring wheat there, 15.4. Where we did wheat fallow, we got 20.7. That was on fallow ground. We're just doing the measure the ones where wheat would have normally gone. Wheat corn fallow, 23.7. Wheat corn pea, 25.8. The interesting thing there, this is a really dry year. Why is this wheat better than this wheat? Organic matter. 12 years of organic matter. We had that one year when we were producing at least peas instead of a zero. It's an organic matter thing. Who said I was going to talk about grazing? <clears throat> I took this picture at Lloydminster, Saskatchewan. How many people have been to Lloydminster? Less people than have been to Chicago, even. John, we really don't know where the hell anything is in Illinois and Indiana. It's just over east. <laughs> right? We don't have a clue where any of them things are. <clears throat> but you can talk about these towns there. We don't know where they're at. The, Lloyd Minster sits right on the border of Alberta and Saskatchewan, east of Edmonton, which is about five or six or seven hours north of the border. Long ways north. Grow a lot of corn there. And they graze it in the winter time. So I took this like in January. There's a cow there, in case you guys really can't see. There's a cow hiding in it. This guy's over here can't see it. That cow's hard to see. That's one of the best things you can do is in, in Canada is they can't really grow corn for corn, but they can grow it as a grazer. And they had to do a lot of grazing because of BSE, mad cow. And I don't know how many years ago it was, maybe 10 years ago, I did a, a whole swing up through northern Canada, or north central Canada, Saskatchewan, Alberta. And I'm listening to the radio, an old cow was worth seven cents or eight cents a pound. Because you couldn't do anything with them, other than make them into dog food. They had to take a bunch of money out of their, their cow raising system, and they did it by quitting hay, you know, quitting doing, hauling stuff and feeding the cows. They put them, put them out. These are Canadian cows, okay? And I'm going to give you a, 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 a link later on. But if you miss it, just Google Alberta swath grazing or Alberta bale grazing. You get all these videos and these guys talk about how they do their different, different things. It's really interesting. Why are we doing this? And Jay talked about it a little bit, and so did Lance. 
in dry or brittle environments. <clears throat> soil biology slows during times of low soil moisture. That would be western, central and western South Dakota. The rumen of grazing animals remains moist, continuing the biological process when it normally would stop. Similarly, in cold climates, soil biology slows during times of low soil temperatures, and Lance brought that up. Talked about the tundra. You realize the tundra is 100 miles north of here, right? <clears throat> Ruth grew up in Winnipeg, which is several hundred miles north of here, and I didn't see any tundra. Still looking for the polar bears when we go up to visit the family. But the rumen of grazing animals remains warm during these times, so that's why this winter grazing thing, like Jay said, is, is really probably a pretty good thing. So here's some of our cover crop. That's a mix of oats and peas and a, and a, and a little bit of, of rapeseed uh, growing after uh, wheat harvest going to corn. Okay, this is our mix. It's not real fancy. We just swath it. We swath it because if you don't swath it, it gets too mature. You wait till it's about right and you swath it. Otherwise, it goes to hell in terms of both quantity and quality. Okay, and there it is. It looks like that. Nice big swath. Right there, it looks nice and green. Uh, if you don't swath it on time, you get less stuff and less quality. If you swath on time, where we did it right, we had a little over four tons of stuff, 20% protein, um, very good feed, oats, peas, and rape. Where we're going to go from wheat to soybeans, then we use a mix of oats, uh, German millet, and brown midrib forage sorghum sedan. And it doesn't grow as late in the fall, so it didn't yield as, as much in terms of tons. Or it's not as good a quality either, but it's an opportunity. And then we use a moving fence. Now you can move it by hand, and there's lots of people who know how to do that, and that's fine. We decided to do that. Most of this we did on our irrigated ground. We use our irrigators to move the fence. So that's a rope hanging down from the irrigator. We've got three of them per span. There's a post and a wire up here and a wire down here and a bucket to keep things from blowing around. And I do have videos of this, but I'm not going to show it because I don't have time. But we just move it every day or two and then the cows follow right behind. In the movie, it shows them running at a dead run. <laughs> as soon as they hear the irrigator going, they just come, it's like, oh, dad's moving the irrigator, right? So there they line up <clears throat> and they graze here uh, the day before and that was the day before that, you can see behind us, but they clean up those swaths all the way down to the ground, but it's nice and uniform. See, there's that fence. And the irrigator, it's a hell of a lot nicer to go out when it's 20 below zero and push a button <laughs> than it is to go, you know, drilling holes and doing whatever. So now, even when it's cold, it's, you know, the irrigator doesn't like it sometimes. Those contactors are kind of a little hard to get them to kick in and stuff. But uh, if you do it right, the manure is nice. You know, the, the hundred and some bushel of wheat that we had is right there is that straw. They never touch that. And then this is the oats stuff. Now, we were drilling most of this. We had, had it so we, we also were doing corn stalks at the same time so we could balance their diet with moving the corn pivot and the oats pivot so they, they got a nice balanced diet. Uh, there's the hay millet stuff and then we swath that. It doesn't look as good but it's okay. The nice thing about swath grazing, if you just leave the cover crop stand there and it gets junk full of snow, they can't eat it. But if you get it in a swath like that, they will eat it. If you go to that Alberta thing, they'll talk about that. I mean, <laughs> they got them out and stuff this deep. And the cow is just going, oh, yeah, there's a swath under here. <laughs> right? But if it's just they're trying to have to stick their nose through it all the time. But if they can get their nose on the end of that swath, they just keep pushing it with their head and going ahead. Uh, it's kind of interesting to watch. And see here, this is... This is them eating through the snow because we had quite a bit of snow at times this year. There's a fence right across there. This wasn't an irrigator, it's actually a fence. You can see where the fence is and, and right there it's you know the swath and they know that the swath goes on, goes on ahead there. The buckets work better, the five gallon buckets work better than the, 
than the, the little tubs. But now here we're doing a thing. What we, we want to do is plant earlier. So we're working with a thing with the Buffett. You know, Howard Buffett gave us some money and told us do whatever we wanted to with it, which is kind of nice, you know. But, but we're trying to, if we can get that cover crop to start consistently before we harvest the present crop, then it's a win because we pick up time and, and, and we don't have the weed problems and we, we get extra time. And, and so we're looking at, at, at seed coatings. And we, we flew at Gettysburg and we flew in this area. Uh, John O'Connell from Letcher flew a bunch of stuff in this area around Mitchell. And I've got a lot of pictures from, from uh, Gettysburg but not from, from John. But here we're flying at Gettysburg. Uh, there's a seed, the coated seed on the ground. We looked at seed with, with just a coating on it. None of this had peat or anything, which I think we're going to need to do. It's just a limestone co coating with absorbent or without absorbent, which you can see the seed. The seed grew better when it was on where it had residue there. So <clears throat> just run through a few. This is field one, bare seed with, with nothing. What we had out there is Indian head lentils, uh, forage peas, and flax. So if you see grass there, it doesn't count. So there's bare seed. There's where we had 50% uh, coating with no absorbent on it. And there's more there uh, <clears throat> with absorbent. There's even more. It's kind of hard to tell there, but if you take a picture like that, that's what that looked like. And, and that's the bare seed equivalent there was, was um, uh, half, 50%. So it would be seven and a half pounds of lentils, 14 pounds of peas, and, and six pounds of flax. Okay, so the same, the same seeding rate on all of them. And then we did a thing that we called um, winter. That was a spring. This is winter lentils, winter peas, and flax. Of course, it's not winter flax, but the same. This is 50%. Again, the same as that bear seed, basically, but it's using winter species. So again, the seven and a half and 14 and, and six. And the winters don't take off as fast as the springs because they're going, well, it's going to be winter. And then I'll rest and then I'll come back next spring, right? It's like winter wheat versus oats. Winter wheat will just lay there and kind of go, oh, okay. And then take off the next spring, whereas oats goes, it's spring. <laughs> Even if it's August, it doesn't know, it's August. It goes, it's spring, and it just, and, and way it goes, and it heads out, and, okay, so there's that looking down the row, okay? <clears throat> and then we, we say, we, we do a winter, it's the same winter things, plus we added a few extra thing, rapeseed and oats. So we put the winter lentil, winter pea, flax, rapeseed, and oats, these are all going to go to to, to wheat to the spring, so we didn't want any winter wheat or anything like that in there. And that's a bit better because you got the oats and things trying to do some things for you. Uh, <clears throat> and that's what it looks like down the row. Okay, and that's just, that's just uh, the 50% with no absorbent. Uh, here's the 50% with absorbent. Looking down the row, that's a bit thicker. Now, not all the time has the absorbent helped us. Sometimes it doesn't help. But in this case, it helped us. Uh, and there, there's another one with absorbent. And then here we go, 70% uh, 70 70 coating uh, with no absorbent. Wasn't all that flash. Uh, and then <clears throat> field one, I showed you this picture before. Here's field one, there's a 50%, zero. And then field four, 50% zero. This is a different field. That one didn't, they were about three miles apart. Okay, so it's not consistent enough. And then, <clears throat> again, field one with the absorbent on it, field four with the absorbent. Again, it's a little better, but it, we'll see the spring what it looks like. Here's that thing I told you about, uh, but just Google Alberta, Swath grazing, whatever. More cows, more goats, more sheep. That's how we're going to feed all these people. The number one meat eaten in the world is goat. <laughs> okay? Just so all you cowboys get, <coughs> get humbled a bit. 100% uh, grass-fed ground beef. 
This is done in Aberdeen. A guy buys cattle from Montana, cull cows, puts them on cover crops at Aberdeen, and he has them as certified grass-fed. Somebody bought off on that. Okay? Use of perennial sequence or perennial cover crops will probably be necessary. We're not going to fix this salinity thing without perennials, and I think Jay talked about that. Right, Jay? Yeah, so I'm good to think Jay took care of my easy work. So I just put one slide in. All tillage tools destroy soil structure. All tillage tools decrease water infiltration. All tillage tools reduce organic matter, and all tillage tools increase weeds. Right? In all these years that I've come here, I showed you every one of those things. All the data behind it. So I just put that in. So you don't get confused as you drive back by the machinery dealership when you leave. Uh, <laughs> bureaucracies, governments, corporations are operated by people with limited tenure. So, some are more limited than others, right? <laughs> <laughs> but they're not going to be here long. Society and landowners and farmers deserve to have long-term research. That's what Dakota Lakes does. Farmers and ranches harvest sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water, produce products they can sell. Some of this is human food. We need to be aware of nutrition issues and off-site impacts. So if we want to eat meat, maybe we should concentrate on producing meat. We have a new director of the West River Ag Center in Rapid City. You know, that's where we kind of house all the cowboys and stuff for the West River thing. And when we were interviewing the candidates, I asked the question, do you think there'll be feedlots in 40 years? Think, think about that. With all the energy it takes and all the problems with biological resistance and all the issues with nutrient cycling and all these issues. And one of the candidates answered, no. The other one went, probably not. So how do we start preparing for that? Tillage is to agriculture where fracking is to petroleum. Tying in with Jay's thing this morning. Uh, they both increase the speed and extent of nutrient removal from a resource, leaving the resource degraded. In mining, that's what we want to do. That's what grandfather did. We can't do that anymore. So we need to quit fracking our soils and start building our soils. Continuous low disturbance no-till in combination with diverse rotations and cover crops is a biological answer to a biological problem. Doing the right thing environmentally is almost always the correct economic approach in the long run. Take the E out of ET and the T out of can't. Thank you. <laughs>